So we're very pleased today to have Timit here for our machine learning seminar. She was a PhD student at Stanford working with Pepe okay. Lee in computer vision, uh, followed by a postdoctoral research position at Microsoft Research in New York in a uh, aptly named group called FATE for <laughs> Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics. Um, having recently completed her postdoc, she is now a, um, uh, a researcher at Google in the Ethical AI group, uh, continuing uh, her, her groundbreaking work in that area. Uh, and she's been uh, featured in a number of different media outlets. Uh, she's uh, ha had a big impact already in the field, not just through her research, but also through her, uh, her leadership, for example, as being one of the co-founders of the Black and AI uh, group. And we're extremely pleased to welcome her back here at MIT today. Thank you. It feels so weird to be back here because I was just here like a few weeks ago in this room, <laughs> except I was wearing my jacket and drinking tea and like I, I was um, coughing and so, you know, it's nice to not do that. Um, I kind of want this talk to be a little bit more of a conversation. Um, so if you have questions in the middle or if you have comments, like feel free to, you know, to interject in the middle. Um, so. So last time when I came uh, to give a talk here, I, I, um, it was like two, two parts to my talk. The first part I was talking about, like um, in my PhD work, we were talking a lot about, you, you know, we were, I was working mostly on using lots of publicly available images to predict demographic characteristics, right? So we um, um, detected and classified lots of Google Street View, uh, um, cars and Google Street View images, and we were trying to figure out what kinds of demographic things we can predict, right? We were like income, um, we were looking at income segregation, um, you know, political leanings, et cetera, et cetera. And like, you know, we got super excited about the kinds of things we were predicting, right? And then we were looking at like, oh, what, you know, um, characteristics of the cars are most highly correlated with various things, things, this kind of stuff. And so we're just like, can we predict this? Yes, yes, um, no. And so one of the things we, we did um, is, oh, can we predict crime rates, right? And, um, and so we're like, oh, yeah, we can, right? And so now um, I kind of have learned you know, some of the issues with doing this kind of stuff. So since we have some time now, I, I, um, I'm, I'm wondering if anybody in the audience can think of Let's say you know you're trying to predict crime rates from publicly available data, right? What what kinds of issues you might might you have? Do we have a, a problem? Which one? Oh, I should use this. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, because there's a mic. I yeah, have. That's recording. Oh, oh. Okay. So um, so I'm wondering, like, can you guys think of any any issues with you know trying to use ground truth data? Uh, trying to train a model using some sort of ground truth that you have, um, whether it's you know um, of, of of let's say crime rates, and to predict you know what the crime rates are in different neighborhoods. Do you do you get the task right? Can you okay yeah. Well, some uh, crimes or when there are more police in a certain neighborhood, there will be more crime reported. But the ground truth reported is not per se the real ground truth. Clearly not a hard enough question. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> well, I was not thinking about this kind of stuff when I was um, working on my project, but so here is um, an example, which is um, estimated drug use in Oakland, and it's, it's basically all over, right? It's, it's uh, uh, when you look at it on the left, um, it's, it's almost uniform, right? Everywhere is, is almost the same. And then on the right-hand side, you see um, what is reported, right? Um, and so basically, the, the drug use that's happening is not the same as the drug use that's being reported, right? And so your ground truth many times is what's being reported. And you train some sort of model um, trying to predict what's being reported. And so this is a lot of what people do in predictive policing, right? And they then try to figure out where, which neighborhoods have quote unquote crime hotspots. 
And then they send more police to these um, neighborhoods that have quote unquote crime hotspots. Then they arrest more people. If you have more police, you're going to arrest more people. And then that feeds into the model. And then they create these runway feedback loops. And so someone who I really admire, her name is Christiane Lum, um, from the um, Human Rights Data Analysis Group, and William Isaacs, um, kind of reverse engineered something called PredPol that's used um, for predictive policing, uh, showing that these kind of runway feedback loops happen and some other um, people have talked about this afterwards. So I, I just kind of wanted to start with this example because this example comes from my work and the issues with my own work, right? Um, so, so this kind of thing started um, getting me thinking about, this is one of the ways in which I started understanding some of the issues of like, you know, predictive um, analytics or whatever, you know, data-driven kinds of things that um, all sorts of people are doing. And given that my background is in computer vision, I, I sort of try to keep track of what are some of the things that are happening in computer vision. Um, and so one thing that's happening is in the realm of employment. Um, and so there is this company called HireVue that has um, over 600 companies as, um, why is my, sorry, I'm supposed to keep track of time here, but it's not keeping track of my time. Yeah, but that's very different from seeing my time on each, you know, slide, but whatever. Um, anyway, so HireVue has over 600 customers um, around the world, and these customers range from, they're different companies, they range from Nike to um, other large companies to um, educational institutions um, and all over the world, right? The UAE government uses HireVue. And what they do is twofold. One is um, if you have a stack of resumes, they, instead of um, kind of ha having recruiters going through the resumes, they have automated tools going through the resumes. Two is that once you go for an interview, um, you get recorded. So because we have a lot more time <laughs> than last time, I'm not really rushing. I want to ask people, like, have you heard of HireVue? No. Has anybody been interviewed by HireVue? No. Okay, many times in the audience there's someone. And so, like, um, so the, when you're going for an interview, they record you, and, um, and when they were advertising, I don't know if they're advertising this anymore on their website, they um, give um, the customer, who is the interviewer, um, what they call verbal and nonverbal cues from your interview. So you don't know as the interviewee um, what that is, and you don't know, like you know that you're being recorded, but you have no idea what other stuff is happening. So when we were in some sort of fairness, ethics, whatever panel with Rana, who, is, who founded Affectiva, I guess that came out of MIT Media Lab, she was like, oh yeah, Affect, um, HireVue, they use us. So they're using emotion recognition. So now when you're being interviewed, you're also your emotions are being analyzed, you know, and um, so the whole the, the whole point is that you don't even know that this is happening as someone who's trying to get a job, right? And let's say the the issue the, the something is wrong with the emotion recognition analysis, or let's say there's something wrong with the automated analysis of their the way they they um, sift resumes to try to figure out who should be um, interviewed. That means you're not, you have a chance of not getting a job like 600 companies around the world, right? This single point of failure means that some glitch there, you might not get a job anywhere. And there might not be any issues, but the point is that we don't have any systems in place right now to, to investigate any of these kinds of um, tools that are being used that are affecting our lives um, very much, right? Employment is a, is a pretty big deal. Um, and then another one I wanted to um, give an example of, I think I, I might have mentioned this last time I came here to give a talk, which is um, um, the government, ICE Immigration Customs Enforcement um, had, when I was at Microsoft Research, had um, suggested um, for tech companies to partner with the government to um, analyze people's social network data to then determine whether these people should be allowed to immigrate, whether they're going to be good citizens or not, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, now I can ask 
you guys. Like, do you see any issues with this? You understand what's, uh, is it clear, like, what they want to do? So do you see any issues, or is it fine? What do you think? What, what's, what's, well, what's there? I don't know. It could be true. If if yeah if so so let's say um, I'm I'm imagining let's say I'm on Twitter, right? And I write a lot. I I say a lot of stuff on Twitter. Um, it's you know public, right? So um, anybody can see all my tweets. They want to analyze those things to determine whether I'll be a good immigrant or not, or if I should not be allowed to immigrate. Things like this, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, when you're interviewed by a human being, you don't know what they're saying and convince. You don't know what triggers they may have or what biases they may have. Now, your point about a single system being very wide in use, I think, is well taken. But does that make it okay if each of the systems were developed independently? Yeah. This is a very good. This is a very good point um, because so. One thing I want to say is that it's true when you're when you're an, an, when you're interviewed by a human, you know. So this is for me like something good and something bad. Some things that people say is that what, there are some hiring tools that they use, where they found that when they use them, they have more diverse um, groups of people um, kind of uh, uh, accepted for the job, right? And so some people even say that about using HireVue. Um, it, because they say it removes the human quote unquote bias. In some ways, I'd say, like, you know, humans are complex. Like, sometimes you, know, you give someone a chance because of some, something you have, some random connection you have. And I don't know if I want to remove that entire thing, right? So, for me, that one of the issues is exactly what you said it's like that one single point in the system where there's no room for different sort of biases, like, to, you know, it's like when you have white noise, I mean physics, right? When you have like different kind of photons going off in, a, in different directions versus like a laser where everything is kind of, is, so I don't think there's, there's any sort of um, chance for that when you use this one system everywhere. That's one thing. The second thing I want to say is that we, some of, one of the points I want to make is that we're trying to have systems in place to, um, to see if people are breaking, for example, equal employment opportunity laws, right? So even though you don't know how, why um, someone um, like accept, you know, gave you an offer versus not, there are supposed to be some regulations in place to like see that there aren't discriminatory, pra discriminatory practices going on. Whereas my argument is that that's not being applied here. So even if, um, so we're not being allowed, we, we're not being given a chance to like test out whether there's discriminatory practices going on here. One, one quick follow up. What I'm trying to do is get to the core of the problem here. If the core of the problem is widespread use of single systems, then that would be fixed by having lots and lots of variations by those systems. And then it would be okay. And I'm being a little bit provocative here on purpose because if it's uniform and anything, we'll make it non uniform. And now there's nothing wrong with having systems. Yeah. Yeah. So for me personally, I don't have like right now objections to automated tools 100% across the board. I have objections to them in some scenarios, but my objection is to them being used without any sort of um, probing or questioning or standardization of some sort. Which which is why I'm like more focused on talking about transparency right now. Um, but another thing, well, anyways, um, maybe in the, in the next kind of couple of slides. So, so this thing happened, and I, and I want to um, discuss, so one of the tools, so if you're going to analyze social networks, right, um, some of the tools that you're going to use, let's say like so, uh, natural language processing tools. And so um, we have um, tools that are not robust, right? So if we go... Um, if we are relying on these tools that are not robust to make decisions about people's lives, I mean, first of all, there's a question of whether you should do these predictive things in the first place, 
right? Whether, whether even if we have whatever like p perfect um, natural language processing tools. But the second thing I want to say is like there's also an issue of robustness, right? So you have this issue of um, a, a, a translation that was translated to attack them, right? So there's a Palestinian guy who wrote "Good morning." It got translated to attack them, and the um, uh, Israeli authorities did uh, arrested this person. And then later, when they went back to see the non-translated version, they decided they, they let him go because they did, they they saw that it was "Good morning," right? And so I want to spend a little bit of time here. First thing is, um, so. First thing is that people trusted the translation, right? So this is something that we call automation bias. So they didn't check to see the non-translated version. And so someone I really admire who works on automation bias is Ayanna Howard. And so she did this experiment, uh, and her students did this experiment where um, they wanted to see how much that how much students would trust a robot. And so they had a simulated Bernie. Like uh, they simulated smoke and stuff. I'm not exactly sure how you can do this in, a, in an experiment. So people thought there was actually like a fire, and they the the robot was telling them like guiding them on where to go, and they would just follow this robot. Doesn't matter like in like things you know roundabout ways like um, paths that don't make any sense whatsoever. And I'm sure like if I was trying to guide you, uh, you know you would probably like ask some questions about why I'm I'm guiding you to different places, right? So they were kind of, there's a few people who, who kind of um, uh, study this, 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 this particular aspect, um, automation bias, which I'm also interested in. A, th a second question is, I question whether, you know, English, you know, I don't know, like some other language translation would have made this mistake, right? If I wrote good morning in French, would it have, you know, been translated to attack them, right? Because this has a lot to do with like the kinds of text, the corpus that, I think I'm, I'm speculating here that we might have. And then the third thing is, it ha there's also a question of who's, tar who's targeted by these systems negatively versus who isn't, right? A Palestinian person is targeted negatively by these systems. And so these are the, some of the, the three um, things that are, um, that one of some of the things that interplay here. And looking at just the robustness issue of, of um, and uh, tools in NLP, or we can even call it bias. I this paper has been around for a while, so I'm not sure if you guys have heard about it. H how many people know this paper? Okay, like less than half, I'd say. Okay, so basically, um, a lot of people, you know, you have these things called word embeddings, and you can think of them as a space in which words that are deemed to be similar to each other are closer in some sort of distance in the space than words that are deemed to be different, right? And so um, you can use word and embeddings to generate analogies. So I can say, you know, oh, you can see everything fine. Like, okay, man is to king as woman is to queen. Um, he's to brother as she's to. Okay, so he's to doctor as she's to. I think you're cheating. Sure, yeah, <laughs> doctor. But a lot of people, um, like I was in a women in data science conference, right? All women and. Um, I said he's to doctor and she's to, they said nurse, right? And so here is an example of, you know, nobody is trying to, oh, and then the worst one is he's to computer programmer as she's to homemaker, right? And so here is an example of someone, all they're doing is having a word embedding that is trained on some, I believe it was Google News um, corpus or something like that. Right, and so I think that will uh, go back to the discussion that we were having before. And so some people might ask, you know, this is some component. It's like it's a word embedding, some some component, some larger system. Why do I care that this kind of societal bias is is showing up here? Right. So going back to Higher View, um, the company that does automated analysis of of um, uh, resumes, right, to determine who should come for an interview versus not. You can imagine two resumes that are exactly the same, right? And one resume um, says, you know, quarterback, University of Vermont. Another one says, softball team captain, Spelman College. Um, you know, this is probably a black woman because Spelman is an um, HBCU, a women's college. And this is probably a white man. And you can imagine. I could use a word embedding to find someone close to, you know, maybe I'm looking for a computer programmer. 
you know, and Java, Python, C++, et cetera, and that word embedding are close to computer programmer, right? So I, so I might want to use a word embedding to, to find someone close to my expertise. And now if I inadvertently, the, all the uh, men are closer to a computer programmer than the women, then I'm, I don't even want to discriminate against someone, but I've created a tool that could be discriminating against people, even when I'm not trying to do this, right? So I could be inadvertently propagating some of these societal biases that can exist. Um, one other thing I want to say about automation bias. So I, um, this is some random thing I'm thinking about. I haven't done anything about it yet, but I kind of want to work on it. Um, I started noticing that um, Translate, tra Facebook Translate, Google Translate are terrible for Amharic and Tigrinya, which are like two Ethiopian and Eritrean languages that I speak. And every time I like write something in Amharic or Tigrinya and I look at the translation, I'm like, oh my god, like some of it is just bad. I don't want people to like even <laughs> read that. And some of it just makes no sense. And so I had this interview, BBC in Amharic, and I'm looking at the translation. So it says, Born in 1983 as a European citizen, okay, first of all, I had political asylum, I was a refugee, I, I had to work really hard to get any sort of, you know, American citizenship, and once I got my passport, I was like, people don't understand what this passport means, it's like a ticket to the world, you don't need visas anywhere, etc. So I was not born as a European citizen. Um, it's called basketball, you know, you can tell that that is like some sort of gibberish, right? Like, you know that that doesn't make any sense. But there are some sentences in there that could be real, right? Because they're grammatically correct. So for example, over there it says, here is my interview with Habib. Does anybody speak Arabic here? Like Habib means my love, right? Imagine a BBC interview um, being like, so actually it's, it should be here's my interview with Tamit. And Tamit is, you know, close to Arabic. Um, it, it's, you know, our, it's in Tigrinya, which is like a, um, a Semitic roots and in Arabic there's the same name and whatever, right? Like so, but when I, what got me thinking with this whole Palestinian uh, kid saying, you know, good morning and translated to attack them and this kind of stuff was, I think that a lot of companies, um, we need to sort of combat automation bias a little bit. So what they want you to do, um, even if Facebook, Google, etc., is they want the, they, the way they're, it's being done right now is that the translation is supposed to be seamless such that you don't even know things are being translated, right? You're supposed to just not even notice. But what I think needs to happen is that we need to have some sort of UI um, or some sort of signaling of like, okay, this part, you know, this language is a work in progress. This part is maybe, you know, does our conf like surface some sort of confidence. And so this is something I, I really would like to partner with an HCI person um, to work on. Um, Going back to um, computer vision um, and why we care about some of these systematic biases. Um, so I, I, I follow very closely the work of people in the Center for Privacy and Equity at um, Georgetown Law. Um, if you guys are interested in, in this kind of stuff, I think you should, you should um, follow them. And they are, they are pretty good. At the, I think they are the foremost experts in the, in the, in the US about various uses of face recognition by either law enforcement or immigration um, officials, et cetera, et cetera. So they wrote this report called the Perpetual Lineup Report. It's a very long report in which they, at, at the end, they also proposed some laws um, that they think should be in place. But their point is that um, law enforcement uses face recognition for anything at any time. We don't know when they use it, um, how they use it, what the accuracy, um, what the characteristics of any of these um, tools are, um, what the documentation is, nothing, right? We're, we're, we're not, we don't know, um, we, we're not auditing them, we don't know how they work. And um, they say one in two American adults is in some sort of uh, face recognition database, right? And in my work um, with actually Joy Volomini, who is at MIT Media Lab, we showed that um, automated facial analysis tools um, exhibit much higher error rates um, for darker people of darker and darker skin type, especially for women. So when we looked at something uh, which is, um, <laughs> so 
it's very interesting. Um, so gender classification systems, right? So automatic gender classification systems that look at a face and they classify the face as a man or a woman. Now, since this work, I've learned a lot even about gender classification systems. Actually, at Google, we've decided not to release um, automated, automatic gender recognition systems because we think the, benef the harms um, outweigh the benefits. So there's lots of work from people in the trans community like Morgan Claus or OS Keys who've worked on kind of the effects of automated gender recognition systems on trans communities. Um, but so here, we wanted to take one um, tool and do a systematic analysis of um, its error rates, right? It doesn't mean that we condone this kind of <laughs> a binary gender classification, or I don't even think like it's, it's something that should exist. But anyways, that's a different story. And so in, this, in the way that um, these tools have it, um, gender classification is like a binary thing, right? So if you flip a coin um, and you are randomly guessing, you would have 50% accuracy, right? So we see that as you go darker and darker in skin type, um, you reach almost random chance in inaccuracy, right? And so when we were doing this work, we had to come up with our own data set because initially what we wanted to do was take existing face recognition data sets, annotate them by you know, gender and different kinds of skin tone, et cetera, et cetera, and try to analyze how well these systems do by these different kinds of um, subgroups. But we couldn't even do that because most of the data sets that we have were overwhelmingly lighter skinned and overwhelmingly male. So we had to come up with our own data set that was balanced by gender and skin type. And why am I saying skin type and not race? Because race is, is, is kind of like a meaningless, well, it's now meaningful because of the, the way that it um, interacts with power. Um, right, but it's it's a relatively new concept in history, right? It's not really um, tied to something very uh, uh, your objective characteristics, right? So, what does it mean to be black? It, well, it means very different in the U.S. It means very different where I come from. It means very different in South Africa. It means very different in Brazil, and it, it meant something different in 1900s, and it was, might mean something different later, right? So, we use something called the Fitzpatrick Skin Type Classification System that. Um, labeled uh, people in bins between one to six, depending on their, their skin type. So this is something that dermatologists use. This is already a problem because people of European descent have all three bins, and the other three bins are for everybody else in the world, right? And so actually, this is interesting. I just met a sociologist at Harvard who told me that he's coming up with a uh, a, a new skin type classification system. So it's like a 10 point scale, and like he hasn't published it yet, but like um, apparently sociologists use um, um, skin types in, in their surveys, so he was coming up with that. But anyway, so we did this, and we then were looking at the accuracy of um, gender classification systems of, of these three companies, and the overall accuracy when we're not breaking it down by skin type or gender seems kind of high, and then we look at disparities now. First, we, we break it up by gender, and we see like some disparities. We break it up by skin type, darker versus lighter spaces, and then we see some disparities. And when we break it down by gender and skin type, that's when we see the highest disparity, right? And the reason, you know, 65%, for example, for darker females versus 98% for lighter females, right? 99% for lighter males. And, um, so this is really interesting. When this work came out, some people were like, why make it better, right? We're not, you know, you're saying that like face recognition is used for surveillance against, you know, for example, um, certain communities, why make it better, right? And so for me, it's like, it's not even, so there's two things. One is um, people in the Center for um, Privacy and Security at Georgetown have talked about how if face recognition is being used by law enforcement and there are these systematic disparities, it doesn't mean it's actually putting some people more at a disadvantage because some people are gonna get sent to jail because of mistaken identity, some people are gonna, so it's not like, you know, you screwed up, you use, you know, bad face recognition systems for surveillance and that makes it better, right? Um, and so what, what I feel like this did 
is start a conversation around what kinds of regulation we need for face recognition, whether it should even be, in San Francisco there is a law that they're hoping to pass that bans it in certain places. And so at least showing the disparity says that you, can't even, you shouldn't be using this kind of system to, um, in high stakes scenarios especially. Um, but in other cases, one sec, um, like maybe you know melanoma detection or something like that, then it's more about like that it is very important to fix that disparity, right? Because that is healthcare, and you want to make sure that you test by different subgroups. Um, yes. Can you back one slide. Um, can you just describe us a bit about how how first the valuation is set up? So you have a, a single. You're trying to match faces to names. No, this is. This is a very. Um, this is a binary gender classification task. He, he was saying, what is the task? Are you trying to ma uh, match faces to names? So we wanted to do, like the point that you're bringing up is, there's different types of automated facial analysis tools, right? There's ver verification, there's recognition, et cetera. And in this case, it's, it's uh, like, it, lo it, it takes a face and it tells you whether it's male or female. Um, so my follow-up question to that is, um, for darker females, um, what is the true noise rate in the in the original in the original data? Right. So, if you were like if you were to ask about inter-rate reliability, one hundred percent. It's one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it w this one wasn't about the difficulty of t so. There are so many issues with just doing this task in the first place, right? Like um, this is why like a lot of people in transgender community object to to it in the first place, um, um, which I mean, which we can get to. But in this case, um, it was it was images of people in parliament, and it was um, there was like no, like so many people labeled it, and there was just really like no no, no integrator reliability. No, but um, labeling the Fitzpatrick skin type. Is a is a hard one. I'm very bad at it, and like we, we relied on a um, dermatologist and stuff like that. Yeah. Given that you, um, I think, eliminated the bias in the training set in doing this experiment, right? No. So that that's 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 the that we didn't. So w what we were trying to do. This is a good point. So. Um, a lot of people had, so one of the, what I really wanted to do in this work is look at commercial um, systems, which means I have no idea what training set they're using. The only th documentation I have is the documentation that comes with their systems. Uh, and I don't know, you know, so I don't know anything. So I didn't know whether, we had a hunch that the, it was the bias in the training set, probably. And so later now we know, yes, because they were using, you know, they were just scraping the web like a lot of us do in computer vision, even in our research. Um, and so they, they immediately like in a, came out with a new kind of, um, like IBM and Microsoft came out with a new uh, system that didn't have this problem, right? Um, so, so this is why for me, well, this kind of your question sort of spurred the follow up, some of my follow up work that I might talk about. Well, so this is when um, the training, this is before it was fixed. After our paper came out, they fixed it. And so the way they fixed it is by having, uh, you know, additional training data uh, from additional different sources. And then it was like, you know, the disparity was much lower. Okay, so what was the disparity in training? In this case, yeah. In this case, yeah. <coughs> I, yeah, but we wouldn't have known, right? Because they didn't tell us what their training data is. Um. You mentioned scraping, and uh, there was some discussion recently about how the IBM like diversity oh, data set yeah. is scraped in Flickr. Um, can you speak a bit about that? Yeah, in this space, it's like every day that passes by, there's a lot that happens. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. And most of it's not good. What? And most of it's not good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, it's very common in computer vision to do this, right? Flickr data, um, and like, you know, so one of the, the things people use in computers is Celeb A, which is celebrities. But how, you know, and so the, the issue here, well, there's, there's many issues, but with the Flickr data set is that 
there, you know, the licensing allows you to do all this sort of stuff, whatever you're doing. So the issue he's talking about is, in response to our work, um, IBM um, also said that it was going to come up with a new benchmark of diverse faces. They call it diverse faces for the public, so that they could test out um, like their algorithms by different subgroups. But what happened is that diverse faces is 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 uh, faces from Flickr, right? And Flickr um, licensing allows you to do all sorts of stuff. But the thing is, what people are saying is that. Like some people put out their pictures on Flickr like 10, 15 years ago. They have no idea that you were going to use it for this kind of um, task for face recognition. And so the, the idea of continuous meaningful consent uh, did not exist, like was not used. So yeah, I mean, so like it's just for me, you know, um, one thing we were thinking about is like, should we even release a data set for people to evaluate on? And then one thing we were saying was we're thinking where maybe, maybe we should we can just have an evaluation server where you have your model you like like Kaggle right like we evaluate it and we tell you what it is what the answers are but like sometimes you know it's some people say you know when you're doing some of this kind of work you're validating certain kinds of tasks that should not even um, be done right like so it just kind of uh, gives me a headache, you know, <laughs> all of it. But yeah, that's that's what what the diversity. And actually, um, around the same time, there was another article that came out that showed that NIST, the um, NIST benchmark, was using a lot of people from vulnerable populations, um, like um, immigrants, um, like when your photo, your visa photos, um, and and various other things. So there's an issue of how we gather data. I mean, I'm glad you're, <laughs> it's kind of a segue for later, but um, how we gather data and what it means to have meaningful consent, right? Um, anyway, so, so some of the lessons I have from, from this kind of work is that first, we can't ignore social and, and structural problems, especially when we're working on these kinds of issues, right? So there's a question of, we talked about, we, shot, we saw the, is, you know, the Palestinian example, um, example here of like what are the neighborhoods in the US that are kind of targeted you know with over policing examples that we showed before and stuff like that you know the society that is marginalized could be different in each country that you're in and each time that passes by but there's usually some sort of um, subgroups of people that are marginalized right and so in this particular case um, you know, I mean, you, I don't know if, if you guys know about Amazon's recognition. They're selling um, face recognition to, you know, that's uh, tools to law enforcement. And, and then, you know, you can ask, like, who are the people working on face recognition, right? Or this is a machine learning colloquium. You can, do you guys know iClear? The iClear people are going to, I mean, I'm actually friends with the people who organize them. But, like, so this is iClear, right? So, what? What year? This was last year. Um, it's going to be in Ethiopia next year, uh, which is kind of um, in Addis, which is where I grew up. But you know, we we don't see there is kind of the intersection between the groups of people that are unfairly targeted and the groups of people um, working on this talk technology is very low. And no matter how well intentioned you are, if you're not, you know, constantly interfacing with people who are unfairly targeted, I feel like we're going to have blind spots and we're going to build technology that unfairly targets people. So one example for me is that when I was working on gender shades, when I, the, um, what I was telling you about the bias in gender classification systems, now I learned that some of the language I use when I'm writing, for example, is not necessarily great for trans communities, right? And so I learned about that just because I was interfacing now with people who are studying these systems from that perspective. And one, one great example here is Deb Raji, who recently um, was first author of a follow-up paper that showed that there are the same systematic biases in um, Amazon's automated uh, facial analysis tools that they're selling to law enforcement. And Deb was about to drop out of the tech industry in general until she came to, she found Black Nai, which, um, which David um, briefly discussed. And Recently, and, and then once Deb wrote this paper, this happened after my last MIT visit. So many things happen so quickly um, these days. Um, when Deb wrote this, um, this paper, Amazon gets, it got a lot of attention. Amazon got super scared. 
And so there were these two officials, Amazon officials, VP of something or the other, um, two of them who wrote blog posts immediately trying to discredit their work from a technical perspective, even from a computer vision perspective. So both her and Joy, my collaborator, were like extremely stressed out because it's this huge company plus their PR firm against these two students, right? So then um, my uh, Meg Mitchell, my collaborator, and I wrote a, paper, wrote a letter. And so I was working on this letter <laughs> since I was, um, when I was here last time too. And we did a point by point sort of takedown, like rebuttal of what they wrote. Um, and we had all of these computer vision researchers sign it, including some deep learning researchers, which then later got a Turing Award. So then the headline was like, Turing Award winner, like says, you know. <laughs> so, so we did that. And I, I guess the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up was that the reason this all happened is because I, you know, sort of, they were there to tell me like, oh my God, help. And then I kind of was willing to stick my neck out in that way. And so a lot of computer vision researchers also were able to do that, right? And I think sometimes as scientists, it's important to do that in addition to the papers that we're writing or like, you know, some of the other things that we're thinking about that advance our career. Um, so then the second thing that I want to discuss is data. So we were talking about training data. Um, how, you know, what's the training data? Where was it, where did we get the training data? Did people have meaningful consent or not? Et cetera, et cetera. We, when we were working on um, gender shades, analyzing commercial um, gender classification systems, we had no, we, the answer was we had no idea. We didn't know anything about the characteristics of the training data, the chest data. We didn't know anything about the model that they used. Um, we didn't know what we should use this, um, a model for versus not? Like, are there unintended consequences that we should think about? Are there any sort of biases that we should think about? There was nothing. There was no information there. So the, the, for me, that was kind of the biggest take takeaway is that even if you have a quote unquote bias system or something, you should at least kind of try to inform the person who's going to use the system about the characteristics of your system, right? Just like documentation. And so, for me, um, well, that's, that's one, one, one uh, thing. But also, kind of like I mentioned before about higher view, we also don't have any laws uh, of what kind of APIs can be used for which kind of high stakes scenarios, right? So we need some of those laws and some of those regulations. Because we might be breaking existing laws even um, at the moment. So in terms of standards and documentation, I want to talk about very briefly other industries that's been there. So I come from the electronics industry where I, I used to design circuits, and we have a lot of documentation there, right? Like for any component, for like a resistor or a capacitor or any, any, anything that's like simple or more complicated, you have, it's associated with a data sheet, right? And so that gives you your non-idealities, right? So you have you know, for me, the analog is for face recognition, there might be some number, accuracy, right? Or in, for resistor, it's like some number, idealized number, V equals IR or whatever. But really, in the real world, that's not, how, <laughs> that's, not, that's not enough, right? There's different kinds of conditions. A resistor for a railroad is different for, than a resistor for like life support systems, right? And so in the electronics industry, you have data sheets, and there's even specific disclaimers that say, don't use it for, long, for, uh, for life support systems. Right, um, and so I've been working on this idea for this paper for a long time <laughs> with um, uh, a lot of collaborators, and so we are trying to figure out, you know, how to have data sheets for um, for data sets, and then for also for pre-trained models. So we call that model cars, but this is data sheets. And um, again, like you know, what are the standard operating characteristics? Um, what if for 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 data sets, it's kind of like you know. What, um, what, are, what are the disclaimers, right? What, um, um, you can say, you know, don't use this for law enforcement purposes. Don't use this, is this not, you know, don't use this to um, deny someone employment, for example. Who's liable if that happens? Um, what is the training data it was trained on? What are some of the characteristics? Was there any sort of meaningful consent? Is there any uh, privacy uh, things, uh, violations that we should uh, worry about? What kind of cleaning did you do in the data, right? Um, right now, we don't know any of this stuff. We don't have any of this information. Um, again, like 
what, what kind of data did you train on, right? Like skin types, geography, gender, et cetera. So that's data sheets for data sets. And for a model car, similar, right? Like now I have a black box model. I'm not releasing a data set. I'm releasing a model. And I might not, you know, it might be a black box. I might not tell you everything about the model, but I want to tell you, you need to tell me some operating characteristics of the model. You know, what did you test it on? You, you, what did you train it on? You might not say exactly what data set you trained on, but maybe you can tell me a little bit about the distributions and some other things that don't disclose exactly the data, but like you can have a data sheet associated with the model card, right? And what are false positive and false negative rates, for example, for different populations, right? So then I can make some sort of an informed decision that maybe I shouldn't use this model for, some, for, for a particular task. What I'm trying to say is that like, it's as someone who was in the electronics industry for a while. Like for me, it is crazy that we don't have this kind of stuff right now and that things are just being used by everybody, including law enforcement, including people trying to hire you, know, hire you versus not, um, without any sort of documentation or standardization. And looking at some, um, back at some, some you know, industries, like there is, you know, you can even look at the car industry in the US where there were no safeguards when cars were on the road, right? Like there were no stop signs or seat belts. Um, and when we're talking about bias here, they were doing crash tests um, on uh, prototypical male uh, dummies, right? D male dummies with prototypical, I'm sorry, dummies with prototypical adult male characteristics. So then a lot of accidents were disproportionately um, killing women and children. Um, and even once they legislated seat belts, they had to do all sorts of campaigns to actually have people to wear them, right? So seat belts were not, I believe, legislated until like 1967. Um, and cars, I feel like, came on the road, you know, in the beginning of the, of the century. So that was a long time ago, right? So uh, I find this really interesting in how choosing a few samples can be really useful for a data sheet. But that seems like it's most useful when we can sort of impose human judgment to try to generalize or interpolate between the samples we've selected. So uh, try a few crash dummies of various types and we can guess maybe how people in between would work. For highly nonlinear models, like facial recognition and things, how can we know these are the right samples to try and how it would behave between them? So you're saying like what should, um, what should you test on? Like, or report in the data, in the data sheet. So my, one, my point with the data sheet and model cards is that first is report what you did, sure. right? And so that's the baseline for me. It's like um, you might not, even if you don't know what to report on, the point of this work is just to like disclose what you did. Um, in terms of face recognition, yeah, it's, it's very interesting because I'm actually currently, well, I'm working on a project where we're like, I, I, was, I was telling David, where like one of the things we're trying to do is generate hard test cases for, for um, some, some sort of uh, facial attribute classification. Um, and so we're using like, we're trying to use, you know, generative like GANs and, and kind of interpolate between samples and see if, if it breaks at the, at the boundary. Right, and like we haven't really formalized um, like what those <laughs> samples should be. But what I want to say is that, and then another problem, which I might not talk about, uh, I don't know if, if this is a problem that you are getting at too, is that what subgroups should you choose when you're, when you're breaking down your, um, your accuracy, right? So we, for example, reported earlier on gender and skin type because we had a hunch that there's an issue with gender and skin type. But um, there are many ways in which you can slice and dice it. Dice it. What about you know, very much darker or much lighter skin uh, type people under 20 or between 15 and 20 with glasses, without glasses? And actually, this is not something we figured out yet. Like some people are, um, like Cynthia Dork, I, I was talking to her, is working on some, some sort of clustering to try to figure some of this out. Nicole and Moralica, some people in theory are thinking about it. But I don't. I don't think it's a it's a solved uh, problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is clinical trials. Same thing. Um, there were a lot of unethical things that were going on. First of all, like experimentation on vulnerable populations, and so um, clinical trials were like actually um, 
not even um, considered legal by the US government. And once they um, did um, consider it legal, a lot of clinical trials did not include a lot of people from different populations. So like for example, women um, were only mandated, it was only mandated very recently that women had to be part of clinical trials and that the results had to be broken down, disaggregated by um, different kinds of um, subgroups. And so, and, and you know, when people are talking about personalized medicine and things like that right now, and like, you know, we're doing, we're trying to do AI plus healthcare, AI plus, you know, automobiles, AI plus X, and here, there was this recent article that I read where it turns out that like, when people are studying DNAs and working on these personalized medicine, et cetera, they're completely ignoring almost 100% almost African um, DNAs, even though the continent has the most diverse gene pool um, because of um, evolution. And apparently, like, I think only 1% of uh, what their studies contain African DNAs. And so now here, there's two problems. One is your next generation drugs are not gonna work on this group of people, and two is, you're just, you're also, your science is gonna suffer because of overfitting, right? So it's, 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 it's twofold. Um, so anyway, so the whole point of this whole thing is saying that we should learn from other industries. And I'm gonna skip all this stuff, all of it, and I wanna get to here because of recent events. Um, okay, so Ali Al-Khatib is a, a PhD student at Stanford and he recently wrote a blog post. Um, and he, he is an anthropologist by training, um, and now he's an HCI. And he was making parallels between anthropology and um, AI now. And he said, you know, anthropology had the eye of the government a while back. Anthropology had a lot of money getting pumped into it a while back. Anthropology was involved in a lot of wars and in a lot of other kinds of things that happened a while back. And anthropologists also thought that they were doing something good, right? And and you know sometimes looking back, there are some things, many things that anthropologists did that were not great. And so there's literature sort of analyzing that. And so Ali Al Khatib is saying that he's seeing a parallel between what's happening right now in AI and um, and what happened in anthropology. And, uh, and so I don't know if you if you want if you're interested in his blog post if you look him uh, up, he he has all of these different um, uh, parallels. And um, recently, like a couple of weeks ago, you know, th this article came out because Google had this external ethics board. There was all sort of you know, and now Amazon has like a fairness group and like they have this NSF you know uh, fairness thing and you know um, there's stuff happening at MIT, there's stuff happening at Stanford, but but what is the meaning of, of these things that are going on, right? We have to ask, when we looked at the Google's ethics board, external one, which it got shut down later, right? Like, if you look at who was at the table, you know, are they people with expertise in, um, what does it mean to be, you know, to a, a, an expert in ethics, right? Are the people, is it the people who might be unfairly targeted that we were talking about? So a lot of these high profile initiatives with lots of money are not including the, the people who they purport to be helping. And so I, I hope all of us sort of think about this, right? Um, and one other thing Ali said, which I think this comes from uh, literature in anthropology is that, you know, we, 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 we are encouraged to take our privilege for granted as researchers, right? Um, and so, and thinking about like how much invisible labor is being done by all sorts of other people, right? Like so, you know, crowd workers is one example. How much are they getting paid? How much are we getting paid? Um, and so these are some of the things I think we should think about. Thank you. So if you could keep your answers and the questions and the answers short, we might have time for two questions. Uh, sure, yeah.
Yeah. But then, yeah, I, t I totally agree with that. But then if you call it a, a sweat and um, what a something detector, a stress detector, but still used it as a lie detector, that's still an issue, right? But it's, it's, it's totally correct. It's, I don't think these issues that we're having are like new. It's just that we, we need to know that they're not new. Yeah? Yeah. Can you elaborate on what you wish happened? Do you think there should be a regulatory body? Do you think there should be an academic focus on these things? Yeah, um, it's just like, I always kind of change my mind on these things. But like, in some ways, I think, so in some ways, there should be like, I think, an FDA for, for these things. Um, like sometimes, you know, it's like finding the, the people who are qualified and can, can, can do this is hard. Um, in many ways, I think there should be a lot more listening to people from marginalized populations who usually sound the alarm a lot, lo a lot earlier than, you know, than by the time we, you know, find these out. Um, and yeah, so and and then in other ways, I think that what one thing I'm trying to do is there should be a, a process change, a change in the, the move fast and break things thing should, you know, kind of like die, right? Like, you know, it's not good to do that, which is why for me, hardware is a very good thing to look at, right? We can't move fast and break things in hardware because, well, it's because of it's <laughs> revenue, exactly. <laughs> it's just too expensive, right? Um, and so I would like for process to be instituted, but that's not enough, All right? right? One last question over here. Thank you for that talk. Um, I think there's an interesting discussion surrounding the integration of these kinds of systems and how they perform in comparison to the status quo. So, for instance, using self-driving cars as a grounding example, you'll have a lot of proponents who argue that statistically there are less accidents as a result of self-driving cars on the road in comparison to human drivers. But at the same rate, a lot of critics will say when there's an accident caused by a Tesla, that that's not acceptable. Yeah. So. At what point do we sort of reconcile what's acceptable as it compares to the status quo? Man, <laughs> I I have a hard time under like with that. I know a lot of times I have e an easier time with what's unacceptable. So like when people ask what is fair, uh, it's it's like a hard question for me. It depends on the context, etc. I have a hard time thinking what is unfair, right? So with self-driving cars right now. If they're consistently, systematically not identifying, you know, darker skin pedestrians or shorter or whatever, I think that's that's a problem, um, right? And then if they're consistently being tested on, you know, U.S. roads and then you take it some other place, there's no safeguards or something. That's a problem. At which point you say there's no problem? I don't like. I. It's a hard question. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you.